Today's topic is trade. As I said, this is one of 10 sessions we're doing with the support of the Heinrich Foundation. Um, we're talking about hidden ingredients in much of the supply chain, the rare earth elements that are used in high tech applications to active pharmaceutical ingredients that are used in all kinds of, of drugs, to vitamins that are used in livestock. In a growing number of cases, these are produced primarily by primarily in China, up to 90% for some of, these in, some of these ingredients in some of these markets. So the question is, how did the U.S. become so dependent on China for these uh, ingredients that are essential for our production and our supply chains? During the webinar, you can raise your hand or submit a question to the Q&A function. To raise your hand, there's a little button down there um, saying that you want to raise your hand. At, when it's time for the Q&A, we will reach out to you, unmute, unmute your mic so you can ask any of the speakers, uh, any of the panelists a question. You can also submit a question under the Q&A function. Um, I would encourage you to use the Q&A function as opposed to the chat function, although they're right next to each other. We are monitoring the Q&A function a little more closely. So that's, that's how we'll get to your question more quickly. Um, but raise your hand, let's get lot, lots of audio questions. We wanna have as good of a discussion as we can. Um, we have three speakers. Glenn Luckenbill is director of the Supply Chain Innovation Forum. Forum at the Ivy College of Business at Iowa State University, go Cyclones, that was my school. We have Jay Nakano, a senior fellow of the Energy, Security, and Climate Change Program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. And we have Kristen Vacasey, an assistant professor at the Department of Political Science in the School of Policy and International Affairs at the University of Maine. So we're going to start with uh, Kristen, um, who is coming to us from a lake house in Maine. Glenn is coming to us from a lake house in the boundary waters of northern Minnesota. And uh, Jane is coming to us um, from her home with a nice uh, image of the CSIS building behind her. Um, so with that, Kristen, I will turn it over to you. Each of the speakers, so, so you know, will talk for nine or 10 minutes. Um, I may interject a question or two, but we have built in you know, 30 minutes for the presentations and then uh, you know, 30 minutes for Q&A afterwards. So we'll turn it over to Kristen. Great, thank you so much. I'm just gonna load up my slides here and let's talk about rare earth metals. So when we think about uh, critical raw materials, right, these things that, um, as uh, Chris said in the introduction, go are really important in the supply chain, rare earth metals are um, particularly important in high tech goods. So there are 17 different um, rare earth metals. This is for just for background, the 15 uh, lanthanides plus scandium and yttrium. Um, and these are necessary for components in lots and lots of different high-tech materials. Um, so there are abundant, more abundant light rare earth elements and a more, little bit more scarce, heavy rare earth elements. And these all have important commercial and uh, military uses which um, we, can, we can talk about today. So things like hybrid car engines, cell phone batteries, components and uh, jet fighter engines, missile guidance systems, and many, many uh, more things. We are all accessing this webinar today in some small part due to rare earth elements. A global demand for these, uh, given what they're used for, really started to rise in the 1980s. The main uh, consumers of rare earth metals were initially Japan, the United States, Germany. Um, now it's this, the global market has expanded more, so we see more use um, from China, India, South Korea, other, other higher tech economies. And the world relies, the, the full world relies really heavily on a single source for these critical rare earth materials, and that's China. The dependence, global dependence on China as a source of rare earths really came to global attention in 2010. And in 2010, this was in the midst of a time where China was starting to sort of cut off uh, global supply through export controls, limiting the amount of rare earths that could be exported to other countries. And in 2010, a Chinese fishing trawler uh, hit a Japanese Coast Guard ship outside of some disputed territories in the East China Sea. After that event, Japanese companies started to report that they were unable to uh, move their rare earth elements out of Chinese ports or up to Japan. And this started a global rare earth crisis. Uh, price, I'll, I'll show some data in a minute, but prices became very volatile. There was concern that, that China would be using rare earth elements in for sort of a resource nationalism, and it, and it came to prominence. Um, after that time, 
there was some sort of initial moves in all of the countries that use rare earth elements to diversify. Um, Japan in particular moved quite aggressively to diversify um, away from dependence away from China through state policy as well as private company initiatives and has now managed to have about 30% of their rare earth supply away from China. The United States and Germany, despite some initial policies, haven't really successfully diversified away from, from dependence on China. Rare earths, after the prices, uh, price crisis slowed down a little bit, sort of moved out of public attention. But then last year, they came into public attention again in the context of U.S.-China trade frictions. In particular, there was in the, the, in the spring of 2019, there was an article in the People's Daily that mentioned that rare earths could come into play in U.S.-China trade frictions. Don't say we didn't warn you. The article read. The United States might have some reasons to be concerned about this. Um, in particular, the United States military does rely on rare earth elements for a whole number of different military, military applications, including, as I mentioned earlier, miss missile guidance and control systems, um, motors and aircrafts and tanks and missile systems, uh, lasers that are used in mine detection, interrogators, underwater mines, all of the things that, uh, many of the things that make um, the United States military a high-tech professional military depend on these critical elements. So how, how really did we get here to having this supply chain vulnerability um, around the world to one particular source? So the so the, the, China has about 30% of global rare earth uh, reserves. So about 30% of known rare earth deposits are under the ground in China. But they have somewhere ranging between, depending on the time and the element, between 70 and 90% of global rare earth production. So this, they started to dominate in the early 90s, and by the mid-1990s, China really had um, really had dominance in rare earth, rare earth materials. This was driven partly by price considerations and the, and the easier environmental re restrictions or non-restrictions in China that made it easier to mine there, but it was also driven by industrial policy from China. So there's real investment and commitment from the Chinese state to making China very competitive in rare, rare earths. There's indeed this famous quote, um, from Deng Xiaoping, where he said, the Middle East has oil and China has rare earths. Now, not to read nefarious intent into that, but just to say that this was a strategic policy decision. And there's been a concerted effort to nurture the industry. And we see this in all stages of the rare earth process, from taking rare earths out of the ground in the mining process to building human capacity to separate the metals and to get them from the ground into things that can actually be used by industry. Chinese industrial policy very interestingly mirrored the same approach that the United States took in the 1950s and 60s to nurture the rare earth industry. Particularly in the United States, the Ames Laboratory and the Rare Earth Information Center used a state investment to support and bolster um, rare earth capacity and intelligence in the United States and then to funnel that into the private sector um, through the Rare Earth Information Center. Um, the United States government support for the rare earth industry declined fairly quickly. Um, the Rare Earth Information Center um, was gone by 2002, but Chinese institutions, in particular places like the National Laboratory of Rare Earth Materials, Chemistry and Applications at Beijing University, um, the Chinese Society of Rare Earths, and other groups are still going strong. We can see the success of these industries I'll just, just say about this so you can see here, right, China's, Chinese production is far, far, far more dominant um, than the rest of the world. Here's the United States. You see it coming up a little bit, but it's still far below um, what, they, what the United States used to have. Um, so you can see the success of Chinese industrial policy through uh, patent filings, as well as other things like students educated and the number of academic programs. But pat patents are a nice measure of innovation. So we can see here, that 
1994, looking at where U.S. Uh, or excuse me, where earth, rare earth patents are filed, China has about seven percent of them in 1994, and they have about 62 percent of global rare earth patents by uh, 2018. Um, Japan also used to be uh, quite dominant in rare earth technologies. Their global share of that has decreased um, over this time. The actual draw number of patents has increased, right? So a lot of research is being done, but most of it is being done in China. Uh, so with respect to thinking about the future of the rare earth industry, how to turn these critical materials into things that will be useful for, for technologies, also military and other and environmental and other kinds of technologies, um, we see a shift in the intellectual power really and investment really towards China. We can also see this um, see in Chinese industrial policy through strategic pricing. So I mentioned that after the 2010 uh, territorial crisis that bled into bled into this rare earth issue um, that there was a lot of price volatility. So I'm just going to show one one of the rare earth. This is lanthanum oxide, and these are lanthanum oxide prices from 2008 to 2015. Right, so so bracketing that crisis. And there's a couple of things to notice here. First is that prices increased by a lot, right? So like 75 times what they had been prior to the crisis. Another thing to notice is that they went back down again, right? So after this period of volatility, prices returned to what many people agree are, are fairly low for what the materials are. And the third thing to notice about this is that the green here is showing lanthanum oxide for export and the orange is showing lanthanum oxide for domestic use. So we see differential pricing um, within, within the Chinese market. I'm sorry, this says, oh yeah, sorry, Chinese domestic use. Um, so we see this differential pricing. And so China has strategically used rare earth prices to um, try and keep rare earth from beginning to end, from mining to industrial end use within China, and also to attract foreign firms that do the more high-tech work with rare earth materials into China. We can see some of the success of those policies through um, some of the actions that foreign firms have taken. So for example, Japanese rare earth related firms have been moving production to China in particular for some of the um, things like with, with battery technology and whatnot. Um, we can also see that even when you do have domestic mining of rare earth metals in China, for example, there's one mine in California, um, that they are then exporting the raw materials to China for some of the final refinement and processing. So this has been a very uh, successful process in terms of industrial policy and attracting high-tech investment to China. So we'll dig a little bit deeper into these. So during the height of the, the height of the rare earth crisis, we can see this is how much by how many times prices increase. So you can see that prices for Chinese domestic use and for export both increased a lot, um, but they increased a lot more for the prices for export. And this started a sh uh, even more of a shift that paid the dividends of, the, of Chinese industrial policy and moved rare earth technology, rare earth um, processing, and rare earth expertise into China. So just to wrap up, um, my, my introductory remarks, the uh, China's control of rare earth metals is not rooted in geography. It's not rooted in geographic destiny, but rather it's rooted in industrial policy and strategic pricing and, and use of, use of the, the talents and the capacities that they have and that they've nurtured. And I, I look forward to the conversation and any questions you might have today. Yeah, Krista, if you could, uh, don't drop your slides yet, go back one slide. Um, I just, a definitions question, uh, the green and the orange bars, heavy and light. What, what do those labels mean? Absolutely. So there are different kinds of rare earth metals and the, and uh, as I said, right, there's the, the 17 and what you see in a rare earth mine is that you'll often you'll have multiple elements that are combined in one in one mine. The heavy rare earth metal, metals are are heavier and will sink to the bottom, and the lighter ones are lighter and will will be at the top. And what so when you are mining rare earths, one of the big challenges of that is that you'll take this big cross section of rock, and then you need to separate those into the 
they're different elements. And so you have an, to a, the level of purity that's needed for the particular product you have. And that separation process is both really, really messy very environmentally messy and costly, and it also can be difficult to do. So, you need, so, so part of developing expertise is to be able to do that. So you can see here, right, there's the differentiation. People, and there's, and I also differentiated by some, oops, excuse me, by some of the, the different elements in this chart here, um, but thinking about them in terms of heavy and light is, is, uh, is what, sort of one way to break them up. Okay, got it. All right, so, um... Yeah, so if you could drop your, your PowerPoint as I'm introducing, uh, reintroducing Jane Nakano, Senior Fellow, Energy Security and Climate uh, Change Program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, CSIS. Um, before joining CSIS, she worked in the Office of Policy and International Affairs in the U.S. Department of Energy. Um, and before that, she uh, worked in the U.S. Embassy in Tokyo as a special assistant to the energy attache. Um, and uh, Jane is going to talk about um, the use of, of rare earths primarily in uh, green technology and how important it is for that and how the, the dominance that China has on it could have implications for the development of our of green, uh, green technology. So Jane, I'll turn it over to you. All right. Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, good morning, everyone. And um, let me just... What did I do with the slide? Oh, here we go, okay. sorry about that. Uh, so the critical minerals, uh, including rare earth, are uh, very key to clean uh, energy technologies. Um, I have a sort of a quick and dirty list to, our, uh, to the left of the screen, uh, shows you the type of uh, minerals that are, uh, that are a key input to wind, uh, wind power, uh, solar PV, uh, as well as lithium ion batteries that are essential for uh, electric vehicles and also some of the grid, high-tech grid systems. So for example, uh, you know, uh, like wind turbines uh, that use critical minerals like rare earth, uh, copper, or aluminum have superior performance compared to other generating uh, generator designs that are used in wind turbine production. Uh, one of the, there are several uh, technologies there, but uh, one design is called direct drive generators. Uh, the direct, direct drive, drive generators that use rare earth-based magnets produce electricity, electricity currents at a relatively lower rotation speed. Uh, so they require and they require uh, much sort of lower maintenance and have a higher energy yield. That's why uh, it's quite popular uh, for uh, wind turbines, uh, the strict uh, drive generators uh, to use rare earth uh, and. For example, uh, solar PV technologies, uh, they primarily use aluminum, copper, uh, and silver. Uh, and aluminum is one of the 35 critical minerals uh, that are, or 35 minerals that are designated as, as critical uh, by the U.S. Department of Interior in their 2018 report. Um, but aluminum uh, accounts for more than 85% of most solar PV components. Uh, and they're used for the frames of the panels. Um, also, uh, as components from, for lithium iron batteries that are key for EVs and smart grids, uh, the demand for critical minerals like uh, lithium, nickel, manganese, and cobalt has been on the rise. Uh, there is a study uh, or report by the Congressional Research Service uh, that came out, I believe, last year that looked at um, the increase in demand for these um, critical minerals for, for clean energy technologies. Uh, they said that uh, nearly all of the critical minerals has increased in production level since 2000. And uh, for example, th uh, production for things like uh, cobalt uh, uh, grew by, I'm sorry, the, uh, the lithium and manganese uh, uh, production level uh, rose by uh, a double uh, between 2000 and um, I think the report came out last year. So I'm thinking um, if I'm not mistaken, perhaps 2018, 2019 timeframe. Also the production for uh, cobalt um, and other uh, minerals uh, grew by three times. Uh, so, but, you know, how much critical minerals uh, demand will grow in the future and also how sort of being import dependent a country may uh, become uh, or the degree of dependency depends on many different things. Um, I, um, 
uh, I have this graph uh, or bar graph uh, on the right hand side that sort of shows you, uh, you know, what are, uh, you know, what's happening a little bit uh, farther down the, the supply chain. But, you know, so in, in many ways, uh, the demand level for these components really depends on how much investment is going into the production or the, the uh, components that are needed for much more of the uh, closer to the end users. Uh, and this, uh, so, you know, for example, uh, things like battery mega factories, how much investment is going into it, uh, in turn, uh, it, it does affect how much minerals are needed. But of course, uh, things like how much investment is being made uh, also depends on, you know, many factors uh, and, you know, um, you know uh, political, economic, uh, as well as regulatory nature. Um, the uh, private sector investment in battery mega factories led to global capacity to increase from uh, just about a little under 60 um, gigawatt, uh, gigawatt hours the first quarter of 2015 to uh, roughly uh, 1.9 terawatt hours in the second quarter of 2019. So it basically so a 32 fold jump. Um, and you know, going forward, uh, there are a lot of um, different um, consulting groups and, and market analysts that look at you know where you know how much investment will be made, and I you know defer to those folks. But uh, one of the consultancies uh, that's that's a leading uh, group uh, called Benchmark Minerals uh, Intelligence has been doing a lot of work. Um, according to them, uh, by 2029, the demand for nickel will double, cobalt to grow by three times and flake uh, graphite about four times and lithium by more than six times. Uh, so you know, as more and more investment goes into things like, you know, uh, about, like lithium ion batteries, of course the component uh, minerals um, demand will continue to increase. And just to, uh, sorry to interrupt Jane, but I want yeah. to let all the viewers know that uh, Jane mentioned a, a Congressional Research Service report. Um, when we when we post information about this session on our website, we will include a, a full list of resources of things such as a CRS report, you know, a GAO report, and other reports as well as media coverage of these issues. So there'll be a full full list of resources that you can access if you want to check back in on the content from today's webinar. Jane, back to you. Yeah, yeah. sounds great. Yep, yeah. um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about. Uh, you know, the US uh, import dependence for these clean energy component minerals. Um, but before that, I wanted to just say that, uh, you know, in, in uh, so many different areas uh, across the, uh, the sort of the economic landscape, there is uh, quite a bit of a competition between the United States and China. And, it, you know, um, and you know, clean energy technology innovation, uh, as well as development and deployment, uh, is yet another area where the U.S. and China are, are competing uh, today. Uh, according to the uh, Bloomberg New Energy Finance uh, uh, survey, or I'm sorry, the report from 2019, uh, the U.S. and China together accounted for roughly half of the total uh, investment into the global investment in renewable uh, capacity uh, made worldwide in 2009. So about half of roughly $280 billion uh, came from the US and China. And there are a lot of companies in this space uh, that are uh, investing uh, um, and innovating as well. And, but you know, the US, as Kristen has already mentioned, the US is uh, you know, it's quite import dependent or it's dependent. Uh, so the China has a lot of resources, but then also uh, processing capacity, midstream, midstream capacity. Um, and, you know, U.S. used to have integrated supply chains where the products were manufactured using uh, minerals and metals mined at home. Um, one of the key um, mines is uh, called the Mountain Pass Mine, uh, in, based in California. And that was, uh, for a couple of decades, uh, a leading global supplier of uh, rare earth uh, minerals, uh, roughly from early 1950s uh, until I'd say like about, uh, well, uh, you know, quote, uh, 1990s or so. But um, as again, Kristen has mentioned, a stringent, um, for the US, I guess, side is stringent domestic environmental regulations uh, compared to the Chinese uh, uh, regulatory standards 
uh, reduced the commercial viability of its rare earth production business, and it forced the U.S. to become highly dependent uh, on imports, mostly on China. Uh, currently, uh, or uh, until really recently, uh, China accounted for about 80% of the rare earth supplies imported by the United States. Uh, there is another report I wanted to just mention. Uh, I guess I already mentioned this, but uh, the Department of Interior uh, put together a list of um, uh, critical minerals that the U.S. is import reliant for. Uh, there are 31 uh, of 35 minerals uh, that are designated as critical. And China dom is dominating the production of uh, these rare earth metals. And Australia is another one uh, that's sort of a leading producer of things like lithium. Uh, but uh, of these 35, uh, I'm sorry, of the 31 uh, that the U.S. is import reliant for, uh, the U.S. lacks uh, production uh, completely on, uh, on 14 of them. Um, so in many ways, in my view, uh, it's, it was a combination of the, the U.S. Reliance, reliance on global markets, uh, you know, again, for you know, several reasons, like environmental uh, cost of comp compliance uh, that made it uh, less economically attractive to keep mining. Uh, uh, but then also, I'd say the relative lack of a strategic push uh, to grow this industry, the critical minerals industry, that has uh, uh, turned U.S. into much more vulnerable to a potential supply disrupt disruption uh, in the, the global supply chain of uh, critical minerals. And um, I guess quickly into um, then what China has been doing in contrast. Uh, in contrast, uh, I'd argue that China has been, uh, has taken a very strategic approach to the critical minerals industry for quite some time. Um, you know, again, uh, you know, uh, Kristen has already uh, introduced the, this famous quote uh, by Deng Xiaoping from uh, in the early 90, 1990s. Um, and, you know, it's very much based on the fact that, you know, China does have uh, resources um, uh, reserves of rare earth minerals and other critical minerals at home. Uh, but it's also interesting to see that um, as early as in the like, mid 80s, uh, China's five year planning uh, uh, for economic planning for rare earth industry, uh, the seventh uh, uh, five year plan for rare earth, in rare earth industry uh, covering 1986 to 1990, already made a, a priority to develop and uh, developed the research and production of advanced uh, rare earth applications and new materials like permanent magnets and lasers for domestic consumption and export. So they were already aware how uh, critical or strategic this sector could be. Uh, and by the turn of this century, uh, the Chinese government's focus uh, has begun to shift away from expanding production towards creating higher value uh, from these uh, raw materials and, and um, try to get more sustainable return from the extraction. And between 2000 and 2016, uh, largely driven by the rising demand for the refined cobalt inputs in the man manufacture of the lithium iron batteries, China expanded its production of refined cobalt by 34 times. Uh, this capacity expansion led Chinese share of the global refinery capacity uh, for cobalt uh, to rise from 3% to 50%. Uh, and by the way, these numbers you can find in a paper that was put together by a few of uh, USGS, uh, US Geological Survey experts, uh, that came out in uh, 2019, um, in case that's of uh, further interest. But uh, you know, and Beijing has not taken uh, foot off the gas, uh, and you know their strategic focus on critical minerals and materials is uh, underscored. Uh, I'd say most recently, prominently in this document called the Made in China 2025. Um, essentially, it's a 10-year uh, strategic plan that was introduced back in 2015 by the Chinese Premier. Uh, the idea here is to try to upgrade China's manufacturing capacity in 10 uh, different industries uh, to make really China more of a just sort of a simple factory for the world into more of a higher end uh, manufacturing powerhouse, if you will. And included in these 10 industries is new materials industry. Uh, uh, by new materials here, they mean per things like permanent magnets, uh, catalytic materials, and um, hydrogen storage materials. And 
Um, it, what's also interesting is, um, you know, the uh, some of the Chinese policymakers um, uh, suggested they actually view this critical um, and so the new materials industry to be not just the, the industry for them to push uh, the growth, uh, but then also as a foundation to support the growth of the nine other industries, such as uh, airspace equipment, medical devices, uh, power equipment, like high voltage uh, transmission uh, uh, technology um, and new information technology uh, like 5G, uh, et cetera. Uh, and, you know, China's policy, uh, you know, as Kristen said, you know, China has uh, and uh, deployed sort of industrial st strategy to this end. And they've um, you know, used uh, things like beneficial tax, uh, um, so the beneficial regulations and tax incentives to create demand uh, for end products in these uh, 10 industries. Uh, also major state owned banks, such as the China Development Bank uh, offers financing uh, to help uh, grow these 10 industries. I'm, am I almost at time or just? A yeah, if we could, we need to get to Glenn. So if you could okay. uh, we can come back to some of these things in the Q and A. Oh, um, sure. Okay, sounds good. Uh, just can I just quickly jump to the last two points though? Yeah, very quickly. Yeah. yeah. So, um, but you know, again, I think you know where China is limited in upstream resources, like uh, raw materials. China has invested abroad. Uh, so, you know, Chinese dominance of critical mineral supply chain lies, uh, in my view, very much sort of midstream and processing. So it, it takes, you know, both uh, in upstream and midstream, but uh, it's, you know, you know, any government that tries to become more competitive in this space really needs to pay attention to both. So thanks. Yeah, I'll wrap up here. Okay, thanks. So, so we want to make sure we have uh, time for questions. We have a couple questions coming in, but I do want to get to um, get to Glenn right now. Um, and uh, we're taking a bit of a pivot here. We've been talking about the rare earth elements and the critical minerals. Glenn's going to talk about things that are, are used and I seen in more, uh, you know, maybe consumer or food and agriculturally focused um, supply chains, such as vitamins. Um, and so, Glenn, I'll turn it over to you. And after Glenn talks, we will have uh, time for questions. We are, you know, we'll go. We'll go to 11.30 or beyond if we have, if I have a lot of questions lined up. So I'll turn it over to Glenn, who is with the, uh, he's a uh, Supply Chain Innovation Forum, Director of the Cy Supply Chain Innovation Forum, Forum at the Ivy School of Business at Iowa State. So Glenn. Thanks, Chris. Uh, I appreciate the Heinrich Foundation sharing this opportunity and uh, really appreciate all the white papers that have been coming out of that. The Heinrich Foundation, if you haven't had a chance to read them, they've been uh, really a great read this summer. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Supply Chain Innovation Forum before I dive into uh, minerals and vitamins. Uh, the Supply Chain Innovation Forum has been in existence for a couple of years at Iowa State. We have uh, corporate members that uh, fund our research. We have eight research assistants in the, in the last uh, academic year. We'll have uh, at least eight in the next academic year. We looked at uh, a lot of innovation, a lot of food supply chain innovation that we've been working on, especially with COVID-19, uh, how do we shorten supply chains and focus on farm to table, uh, meat processing automation, vertical farming, unmanned farmers markets, uh, drone delivery networks, autonomous farming equipment, all of the types of things that uh, we think are going to make uh, supply chains more efficient. I wanna to start to transition this though into food uh, automation, supply chain automation. We're looking at uh, autonomous trucking, port and terminal automation, last mile automation with robots and drones and even drone distribution networks. Supply chain visibility is really important with uh, EDL and GPS now enabling live tracking and focusing on all the exception management. We have live ETA and, and a new, uh, a new uh, opportunity with dynamic optimization. Uh, we're also looking into uh, implementing digital twins. We're currently building digital twins of our U.S. rail network as well as uh, the Mississippi River uh, traffic network, doing simulations uh, and then multi-objective and multi-mode optimizations utilizing high-performance computing. Multi-objective is really important because when we think about now the importance of having a reliable source of critical ingredients, uh, uh, risk becomes an objective or mitigating risk becomes an objective and multi-objective optimization will help us minimize risk. 
And multi-mode is going into not only trucking and rail and shipping, but also into alternative modes of transportation associated with um, the opportunities associated with your uh, local last, last mile drivers or DoorDash and, and Uber Eats and things like that. Uh, supply chain forensics is where we really get interesting. This is a, a newly emerging uh, field that leverages data, industrial IoT, and artificial intelligence and enables us to predict supply chain disruptions. And historically, uh, price adjustments have been able to balance supply and demand. Uh, but when you get into events, uh, you know, the low probability events, such as a pandemic, uh, you see all kinds of supply and demand imbalances and being able to predict uh, shortages is, is critical if we're going to maintain our food supply chain. Supply chain forensics started out really in the military and Department of Defense. And if you think about the importance of every component in a rocket or a missile or a, a, a Air Force jet, uh, it's important that every component is traced uh, back to the origin. And in many cases, you're going back three or four or five tiers to make sure that the, the materials, the metallurgy, the components are all uh, going to be reliable and made of the right materials and, and won't fail. And so there's a, a, a real need for supply chain forensics, not only in the Department of Defense, but also in the energy industry and in uh, food and, and the agricultural industry as well. And so when you think about all of the critical infrastructure sectors, uh, historically, maybe one of the industries in one region might be out of balance and you could focus on it. But if uh, we're really going to focus in on food and agriculture and, and sustainability and, and security, we're really talking about depending upon the chemicals industry, financial industry, IT, transportation, water, and all of those industries focus on energy or rely on energy and communications and dams and all of those industries rely on nuclear commercial facilities, critical manufacturing, and uh, the government. And what we're starting to do is build databases. And if you think about all of the databases and the new ability to utilize databasing technology to analyze structured and unstructured data, we can start to develop the ability to predict supply chain disruptions. And so, uh, as we were just talking about uh, metals, if you're looking at lithium ion batteries, for example, if you know what's going on in the cobalt industry and you know what's going on with uh, the Chinese government investment strategy and what's happening in Silicon Valley related to lithium ion batteries, you need to know about all of these things because they all could impact the price and availability of lithium ion batteries. Or maybe there's an alternative technology such as hydrogen fuel cells and what impact will that have on the demand for lithium ion batteries. So building these related databases and putting all the databases together is something that precious metal is about for anything where we have a dependency uh, on foreign sources. So getting into critical ingredients, uh, if you think about the um, pharmaceutical industry, they've already identified over 156 life-saving drugs for which the U.S. is entirely dependent on foreign sources. And so there's a need to determine what uh, steps we might be able to take in order to produce those domestically or to at least have dual sourcing. Uh, and then there's, there are dozens of food and feed grade vitamins, minerals, and preservatives for which the U.S. is entirely dependent upon foreign sources. There are about uh, 14 critical vitamins that used to be produced uh, globally and in the U.S., but over the last 20 years, uh, the production of many of these vitamins has shipped almost entirely to China. And so if you look at, uh, I think there's nine of the 14 are produced, over 90% of the uh, global production is manufactured in China. And uh, so this creates a, a major vulnerability as many of these vitamins are ingredients in processed foods and in the feed that goes into our um, livestock feed. And we are really dependent upon China for many of these. And so we're taking some steps to make sure that the production and flow of these critical ingredients continues to flow. And uh, the way we're doing that is incorporating supply chain forensics. And that begins with supply chain mapping. And I'm not gonna get into the mapping of the uh, pharmaceuticals or the vitamins, but I am gonna give you an example of how this works. And so we've done some supply chain mapping, for example, of Reese's peanut butter cups. And what we do is we look at the bill of material, identify the manufacturing process, all of the tier one sources, warehouses, the modes of transportation and packaging, and um, figure out how all of the ingredients come to be the product, the end product. 
And so if you think about uh, producing chocolate as one of the major ingredients in a Reese's peanut butter cup, some people will say those aren't uh, critical, but I think they are. The uh, cocoa beans, cocoa beans um, go through a very sophisticated process to get to the point where the, the chocolate can be used to uh, produce a uh, piece of candy. And so we looked at who are the major suppliers, who are the major suppliers, and uh, Cargill recently bought ADM, and so Cargill and ADM are the largest U.S. supplier of, of chocolate, and they supply the majority of the chocolate that goes into these peanut butter cups. And mo much of that, most of that, comes out of the Ivory Coast. And uh, we get into de detailed tier two mapping, Cargill acquires cocoa beans from over 30 co-ops uh, in Ecuador, Ghana, and the Ivory Coast. And in the Ivory Coast, the beans, a lot of the beans flow through a market in Yamasucro to the port of Abidjan in the south. And so we track this back. The cargo has a production plant on the north side of Abidjan, and um, the chocolate gets processed and then shipped through the city down to the port. And at the port, we track uh, the chocolate into the cargo West Africa warehouse. It gets uh, put into shipping containers, trans transferred over to APM terminals, and is shipped by Maersk into the U.S. East Coast. And so we've actually identified the, the, the way that all of the chocolate gets from the Tier 4 farmers all the way back into the farms and uh, they sell the cocoa beans to the co-ops and then step five in the process is to identify all the external factors that it could impact the supply. And this gets into the people, all the industry influencers and all of their colleagues and mentors and connections. It gets into tracking the weather, including floods and fires, uh, infrastructure, including all the roadways and bridges and communications, technology and the power required to move uh, to move and process all of the ingredients, uh, port operations and capacity, pests and availability of pesticides, and some industries right now are being impacted by the major swarm of locusts that are impacting not so much the Ivory Coast, but the uh, uh, Northeast Africa and the Middle East. Uh, local politics is a big impact, uh, can have a big impact on the availability of supply, and as a matter of fact, there's one woman in the Ivory Coast who has uh, slowed down or stopped the, the movement of cocoa in order to get concessions on uh, child labor and other local politics. Uh, national politics can have an impact also with elections and candidate platforms and uh, international organizations such as the World Trade Organization, UN and IMF, also some of their policies and, and regulations can impact the supply of critical ingredients. And uh, of course, banking and availability of loans for farmers uh, also can impact uh, production and availability. All of these things go into databases. All the databases then are put into a data lake. And we're able to identify events that uh, could have an impact on the supply, in this case, chocolate. We monitor the production and flow, utilizing sensors and, and data from the supply chain visibility companies. I mentioned uh, two, I mentioned supply chain visibility, but two of the leaders in uh, supply chain visibility are Four Kites and Project 44. And what we're able to do with IoT and supply chain visibility is to detect anomalies. When things stop moving or moving into a plant or out of a plant, uh, we can detect anomalies and start to investigate what's happening. Why is, why is this particular plant not producing uh, the same volumes or um, why are they not shipping to a particular port? And uh, we'll be able to identify and uh, hopefully address any particular uh, shortages or uh, potential supply chain disruptions. So the databasing is the real new uh, element here that enables supply chain forensics. Again, the data lakes enable artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning to evaluate structured and unstructured data uh, in order to predict supply chain disruptions. So we're beginning to apply supply chain forensics to a number of critical ingredients. And uh, in China, there are about 20 plants that manufacture the majority of the pharmaceuticals and uh, vitamins that flow from China into the U.S. And so we've begun to really uh, think about how do we make sure that those critical ingredients continue to flow. So I'll end there and uh, maybe save some of the other stuff for, for questions and answers. Okay, so we have uh, uh, questions coming in. Um, I think one of the, the, the key question that's kind of on everybody's mind, um, and maybe if, if uh, I'd like to toss this out both to, to Kristen and to Glenn, um, you know, we're, we're, we're 90 percent 90 percent dependent on China for the a different different kinds of essential elements or essential ingredients from the rare earth elements 
to things like vitamins, you know, entirely different food supply chain or entirely different supply chains, um, but we're 90% dependent on one country for that. I mean, how likely is it that that Beijing will hold that, you know, hold that over us, uh, cut off critical supplies that help our food supply, that help our military technology? Um, is it likely that these kind of essential ingredients will get caught up in the trade war? Maybe, Christian, if you could take a stab at that first. Sure. Uh, thanks. I think that's a really important question. And one of the, I think one of the, the way to think about this is that because of the imbalance of trade between the United States and China, there are like, limited tools that are going to be really painful that China can use vis-a-vis -vis the United States. And right, so a limited number of arrows that they can effectively shoot. That and, and rare earths are are one of those arrows. That said, once that arrow is released, um, there will be all of these um, sort of roll down policies, right? That that are responses to that. So if we look back 10 years ago and what happened when China probably released that arrow. Now, this is officially denied, but in the, in the so there, this is a different context. The Chinese government said they never, re, they never actually cut off exports to Japan. But Japan, Japanese, the state and the, the government and companies responded as if they had Right. So they took that risk like, oh, this is going to be a geopolitical tool. We need to respond. And Japan effectively responded to that. Now, other users, the United States and Germany, didn't take that lesson maybe as seriously as Japan did. But I, I think that there's that the decision makers in Beijing are probably sitting there thinking, look, if we, we can only use this once. And it better be at exactly the right time to get the policy outcome we want. That didn't happen in the case with Japan. And, and so it's, it's a very, very high risk maneuver for, for China to take. So I think that the odds of them actually cutting off are low, but there are all these other policy tools. There are prices, there's policy, there's attracting FDI. And that's where, that's where I think the real vulnerabilities lie rather than actually cutting off supply. Okay. And Glenn, how about when it comes to the food supply chain and vitamins and things like that? Is there, is there a chance that China will cut us off? Use that, use that arrow? Yeah, we've gone through and done a, a lot of game theory to figure out if we do X, they'll do Y. And if they do X, we'll do Y. Uh, how do we prepare for that? How do we predict what is likely to happen in this, uh, in this whole war? And will they flip a switch? If they flip a switch, it could be really painful today. And uh, we are extremely vulnerable, and I think uh, that's something that you know we need to think about our industrial policy. You know, we don't really have a really coordinated industrial policy because we're a free market economy. And I want to try to remain political here, but the, the Chinese industrial policy is: hey, we're going to dominate these industries, and we're going to take these steps in order to uh, have price controls and, and maximize profits. Um, we need to think about where we are vulnerable and have some sort of um, some sort of effort to bring the private sector together through maybe public-private partnerships, including uh, companies or groups like uh, InfraGuard, who we've worked with to start to think about how do we protect the food supply chain. And uh, if we can do these, apply the critical ingredients, make sure that we have uh, supply chain network optimization, including multi-objective optimization for risk management, uh, then we'll start to incentivize in some way production of those critical ingredients. And um, we need to think about regulations as well. I'm sitting in Ely, Minnesota, where over 60% of the residences have a sign in their front yard. They, they say either we support mining or protect our environment. And so the, the company that's trying to produce rare mineral or rare metals and uh, precious metals in Northern Minnesota has spent over a hundred million dollars and over 10 years trying to get approvals to mine. And so uh, I think it's, it's gonna be really challenging for us to catch up in a lot of these critical ingredients if we don't uh, think about the policies and, and regulations required to, to compete in those particular commodities. Okay. Kristen, I've got a, a follow-up question for you. Um, it, when is the best time for Beijing to release that arrow if they were going to? Um, that's a, that's a great question. We'd have to see how events played out. Um, but I would, I would, Probably if there was some very specific policy target 
that they could link that policy to, right? So that you could say, well, we're going to limit these in less. So then it would, it would need to be a very specific win. I mean, in the it, looking historically um, at the case with Japan, it was in the it was in the context of this territorial dispute. Um, I think a real win for J for China there would have been uh, acknowledgement of Chinese claims from the Japanese government. They certainly did not get that. Um, but there there could be right so maybe some real real tariff concessions that they would be trying to get. Um, perhaps um, concessions on, on cooperation with Huawei, something like that. There'd have to be something very specific. Okay. Uh, but we'll, we'll have to see how, how it, the situation plays out. Okay. But I could, if I could follow up about, so we've talked about like production, domestic mining in the United States. And this is, I think, this really important point that I, I, I want to emphasize, and I think Jane also emphasized, is that it's not just about mining. So we can mine in the United States, and the one of the problems with mining is so if you mine all of these minerals, suddenly that will flood the market. China could also flood the market and drive prices down. That quickly makes a new mine unprofitable. So even without regulations, right? So there's these underlying political economy issues. But then even if you mine, you need to make sure that you have those midstream capabilities. And that's where Chinese industrial policy has been really successful. And that, that's where I think the United States, we, we, have, we have the National Science Foundation, we have these policies in place to try and rebuild the capacity, the human capacity of, and with rare earth expertise. But that's, that takes time. That's not just opening a new mine that's getting the full capabilities and expertise all the way down to industrial end use. Okay. Um, so we have a question here for Jane from uh, Pat, Ra Pat, Ralaka, ha, Pat Ralaka Chatterjee, a columnist in New Delhi. Um, are there medical devices that use critical minerals? Um, I No, thanks for the question, but uh, I wish I could answer, but I... Uh, you know, my main focus has always, always been energy and climate related policy issues. So I do not know exactly uh, what sort of a, a component, I mean, what, how the, you know, their use in the medical device, perhaps my uh, you know, others on the panel uh, may be much more knowledgeable on this. Okay, that's fine. Um, Glenn, we got a question for you from Bob Ferrari, who is executive editor of Supply Chain Matters. Uh, given the new th threats of pandemics, uh, Ebola, COVID, swine flu, does the Iowa State disruption model now account for such risks and occurrences? Uh, Glenn, can't hear you. Sorry about that. Yes, we're, um, we're working to uh, look at how do we utilize events to trigger some of the uh, predictive analytics. So. You know, there were a few cases of a swine flu in China last week. And so we're looking now to say, all right, where does that stand each day? What are the potential impacts of that? How quickly is that spreading? And, uh, you know, what are the ways that that, that could be transmitted to the U.S. and impact the U.S. Uh, uh, livestock? And so, uh, yes, all of the databases uh, utilize, we utilize the structured and unstructured data to be able to identify seeds or, or events that could trigger an impact on um, supply chains and, and, and we try to predict disruptions. And uh, hopefully uh, we can start to develop the machine learning that will enable us to utilize those seeds to say what is likely to happen. And then we're working also to try to integrate with uh, some of the classified databases in the US government so we can actually get seeds out of the classified data that we know Hey, this could impact um, a supply chain to make sure that we're prepared for a uh, potential impact. So the intent is, yes, this is still in the early stages. We're still developing the technology. Okay. Um, so I have a question. Um, I think this would be for Kristen or Jane um, from Noor uh, Coquillard. Uh, China has 30% of the world's rare earth deposits, but 70% of the world's mining and sales. What are the equivalent numbers um, for the U.S., if the U.S. ramped up production, how much of its own demand could be met? Do you, either of you kind of have a sense of those numbers? We're waiting to see who will move first here. 
Jane, Jane, why don't you take that? Sure. Um, so, so, uh, I really, so I, I think it really, um, I'm not sure. I mean, so obviously I do look at much more uh, the supply chain for the clean energy technology side, but I do not know exactly how much uh, of the domestic output could really meet the growing demand. I think it probably, and this isn't really the direct answer to this in a really good question, but uh, it will, I think, also depend in part to how, uh, what sort of overseas investments that the U.S. may be making, because as, uh, you know, Kristen mentioned, you know, they're light uh, rare earth and heavy rare earth, different, um, you know, uh, rare earth and different critical minerals have different uh, characteristics. So I'm not sure exactly how uh, you know, given both the, the demand will be changing, uh, you know, and along what what time uh, timeline, but then how the production could be ramped up for anything that's you know uh, for you know number of specific things that that are required. So. Okay. All right. Um, we we is... don't just to mention we do we don't have a domestic supply of yttrium, so that's something that that we we do need to the United States does need to have a foreign supply form. Okay. If, actually, if I may quickly add just the, the is, can I, um, yeah. Chris? It's okay, yeah. yeah. So the, so even the Chinese one, I, I think I'm looking at this 30% figure that a uh, uh, person that submitted a question noted. But for example, even for the cobalt um, production, the Chinese really were import dependent actually for cobalt itself. And it, by, you know, investing, making a lot of overseas direct, uh, foreign direct investments in places like Congo, they were able to reduce their supply dependence. That's my understanding. So, you know, even the Chinese numbers, when you, you know, the, it's not just, the, you know, what's in China, but then combined with uh, the control over these overseas mines, I think the figures you know, look higher than most other countries for many of these critical minerals. But I think if we're just looking at the domestic geological sources, um, you know, it's it's not a easy, you know, it, it's, well, you know, who ever said it would be easy, but um, it's not going to be easy um, in the effort, so. Okay. Um, just a quick follow-up, um, Kristen, uh, you, a minute ago you said yttrium, what what how's that spelled and what is that exactly? Sure, yeah. So um so yttrium is y t t r i u m, um mm -hmm. and that's one of the sort of the addition the it's the the the, the lanthanides plus scandium yttrium. So this yttrium is the is one of the rare earths that we um, that we do not have a domestic supply for. It is also one of the the elements that's considered critical, including military and, and military capacity. We do have some strategic uh, stockpiles of yttrium. Um, the Department of Defense has a list of, of minerals. You can find the, the list of stockpiles in the um, U.S. Geological uh, Survey's reports and reports on rare earths, as well as in Department of Defense. Uh, uh, documents that are available online and um, they and, and so that's it's, it is one of the ones we do need for military technologies in the United States and there's there there's it's not possible to have domestic mining unless we discover new deposit new deposits okay um, this is another supply question or, or, or production question from Bill Kelly there have been attempts to expand American rare earth element production specifically exploiting uh, uh, Niobium scandium deposits in Nebraska. I hope I'm pronouncing the niobium right. Right. Broadly, would increasing U.S. rare earth production have an impact on demand? Is there demand specifically for niobium scandium? Uh, so, increasing domestic production would definitely affect price. Um, and so it, there might be a temporary surge in demand as people took advantage of low prices. Um, one way that rare earth mining is often described is it's, it's parasitic. Uh, so you mine, the prices collapse, the mine goes under. Um, so I, I don't, I don't think that having U.S. production would would have a have a huge demand effect, but it would definitely have a have a supply effect, um, which would, would affect prices. And it, that's that's the case for industrial policy. That that it's that there's these price initial price problems with starting up mining. I, again, I, I don't want to make the case for industrial policy today, similar to Glenn, but that's, 
<laughs> that's the case for it. Okay. So Glenn, this one uh, is best directed at you um, from David Cossack. The decision to source pharmaceutical ingredients in China or elsewhere overseas is largely made by private U.S. companies looking to optimize their operational efficiency and profitability. They presumably assess supply risk. Uh, uh, why will this dependency change if corporations are not interested in changing the current structure? Yeah, I think the multi-objective optimization is, is what's really changing and people are placing a bigger importance on reliability of supply uh, with the ports shutting down in China for you know, several weeks in uh, following the Chinese New Year, there was a shortage of a lot of things that typically come out of China. And uh, I think if we wanna have uh, security of supply, we either need bigger uh, inventory stocks or we need to have dual sourcing or some other way in order to uh, ensure that we have uh, these critical ingredients. And uh, I think many of the U.S. companies that operate in China uh, realize that you know, there's probably a case for uh, dual sourcing or for increasing safety stocks in order to be prepared for any type of event such as the pandemic or any other type of uh, cold war, uh, cold trade war uh, event with China that might occur. Okay. Um, so we have time for just a couple more questions. If anybody out there has a question you want to raise your hand and ask it uh, verbally or, or send it in, we'll, we'll work it in in the next couple of minutes here. Um, but we have one question about the, the politics and policy dimensions of this uh, uh, on rare earth specifically, Kristen or Jane. Um, what is, what's going on in Congress about this? I mean, I've, there have been there have been uh, efforts, uh, Senator Ted Cruz, Senator Lisa Murkowski have both pushed legislation that would offer tax breaks or other incentives to spur production of rare earths. Is this an issue that's going anywhere in Congress? And is there a, is there, you know, is there a left-right divide on this in any way? Um, Kristen or Jane, if one of you want to take that. That's a great question. Sure. So that's, yeah, that's a great question. Initially, after 2010, there were a few initiatives in Congress to try and push rare earths um, there. At, as a result of some, of some of that attention, the Mountain Pass Mine in California, which Jane mentioned earlier, did reopen. Uh, it was opened and did get back up to production. And then it filed for bankruptcy and was purchased by a Canadian company called Neodynamics. Uh, Neodynamics now ships its the rare earth materials from Mountain Pass Mine. Now, yeah, so in some other mines to China for a lot of their R and D and processing, uh, there's right there's this movement there's this this sort of bill that's been written by Senators um, Cruz and Murkowski that has hasn't I don't think it's preceded the 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 left right divide that might exist has to do with environmental regulations right and the, the tension between opening new production sites or mining sites and um, protecting the runoff waters from the toxic sludge that is produced from rare earth mining. It's a very environmentally costly process. Um, but there, I think there is broad consensus that vulnerabil supply chain vulnerability is a political problem. So that, that isn't where the, where the right left, right, uh, where right left divide exists. I don't know, Jane, if you have anything to. No, um, no, I, no I definitely second uh, what you said, Kristen. Um, it's, it's a more of an environmental regulation and perhaps upstream, uh, you know, exploration, you know, regulation side where perhaps there's more of a partisan, you know, differencing uh, opinions. But then there is the, I, I think there has been a, this concern and awareness on the Hill for quite some time, even, you know, starting from 2010, the Chinese action. But, uh, you know, in light of the COVID related uh, induced supply chain vulnerability awareness, uh, I think the I think the focus has sh uh, that sharpened. I think congressional focus, and I think it's a pretty uh, balanced look. You know, looking not just the, the uh, upstream, but then also you know human resources uh, as well as processing capacity. So I'd say yeah, there's much much, much broader uh, uh, look with the added momentum uh, in the post COVID world. Okay. So we have a question here also dealing with production of, of the raw materials, rare earths from Paul, Di Paul Dinsdale. What opportunities are there to source raw materials more in developing African countries rather than China? And what would the impacts of that be on the world economy? Christian, could you take that one? 
Sure, absolutely. And I want to say it's not Dion Dynamics, it's Neo Materials is the name of the, the company, just for okay. clarity. Um, so there has been some effort put, in, put into doing this. China also, as, as Jane mentioned, has done this, right? China's gone out and sourced mid critical materials that they don't have good domestic supplies for, um, uh, with, partially through their Belt and Road Initiative in Africa and other places. Um, it, it's fairly time consuming and high risk to try and source these materials um, um, there are right now uh, 13 identified potential mining sites in um, throughout Africa. Two of these are producing. There's one, and only one is, is reliable. It's in Burundi, um, and uh, called the Gakara Mine. And uh, three of the 13 have failed, and the other eight are at very early stages, despite some of them after 10, 20 years of effort put, put into this. Um, so so it's, it's something that people are pursuing. The mines are typically either, either state-owned mines or they um, are owned by um, European, European companies. Uh, the two mines that are producing, these are mines that were operating under a colonization, time, the time of colonization. And so they're, they were able to um, get up to um, production a little bit more quickly, um, but all of the other, other concerns exist. Uh, Australia is a really good source of rare earth mines and the Linus company is one of the places that, the, one of the, the major rare earth, global rare earth companies. Uh, Linus is opening up a, a joint venture in Texas right now, or trying to. And Linus also has a partnership with Japan um, where they have, and they send things to, um, Malaysia for processing and then that again has run into just huge environmental problems and conflicts with local populations and it, it's been a really tough road to try and diversify out of China. Okay, um, uh, Jane, um, uh, both you and Kristen touched on the environmental aspect of, of rare earth mining um, and there is a there is a mine in the U.S. Mountain Pass, California. Is that, I mean what is the status of that mine? How, how, you know, is that producing now or is it will be producing later on? And are the environmental, potential environmental damages impeding the ability for it to, for them to mine there? So, so um, Mountain Pass Mine in California uh, is producing, uh, but again, uh, as Kristen mentioned, uh, you know, the, the raw uh, materials have to be shipped uh, abroad uh, in, much, you know, a lot of it if not, you know, most of it from what, what I uh, understand is to China for subsequent processing, more of a higher value uh, uh, steps, if you will. Um, as far as environmental uh, regulations go, I am not aware of anything that may be unique to, um, unique, uh, to the continued expansion effort uh, at the mountain pass in uh, California, but elsewhere within the United States, um, you know, uh, I, I think, you know, there's, you know, um, uh, greater awareness now. Um, and also just to mention, um, I, I think in my mind, it wasn't, you know, how the, there was a gap between enver environmental standards between the U.S., let's say 1990, and then in China. To me, it wasn't so much the Chinese were trying to, um, you know, uh, use it as sort of leverage. I think, I mean, China has been trying to clean up quite a bit. China is trying to address the illegal mining in part because illegal mining does uh, uh, adversely affect the price level, the desirable price level, uh, right, for a lot of state-owned uh, Chinese companies uh, that want to have more secure return. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's, to me, it's sort of part of the economic development sort of a, a path that, you know, back then, you know, yes, there was gap, but uh, it's, you know, the environmental issues is another one in my mind that, to be honest with you, I think there could be a lot of lessons learned uh, exchange between the U.S. and some of the Chinese uh, technical experts just because they've been doing it. And I haven't really looked into the, the you know, the degree of, degree of automation or certain steps that they have uh, employed in China just because they are continuing to uh, operate, uh, but there might be certain stuff uh, that, you know, we might, that might be of interest um, as we try to uh, expand domestic operation here in the U.S. 